So it is uh, November 12th, uh, 2019. I can't believe that very soon we start to write the, the year 2020. My, my brain is not ready for 2020 at the edge of my note-taking papers. <clears throat> um, and we are on an Inside Jerry's Brain call, which means, and I'm apologizing ahead of time, that I will overshare my brain as we go through uh, talking about different issues. And our topic at hand is how to represent an argument or a point of view in the brain or in something like the brain. And I come to this, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, share my brain right now. I come to this really from um, the realization of several things. One, let me go to uh, a thought that I added to my brain, uh, I don't know, a year, a year, year and a half ago, when uh, this is called my ahas about soil and growing or raising food. And I, it dawned on me that I had a whole bunch of different little uh, places in my brain that had no-till farming, soil fertility, uh, fungi and micro rhizomes, uh, the wood wide web, uh, a whole bunch of different things, and that they weren't connected. So I just made this nexus. I said, okay, what, you know, how do I bring these things together? And then how do I connect this thought, my ahas, uh, about this particular set of topics to the best of the core of all those different kinds of things. So for instance, there's a, a pattern language for growing food, uh, which is a nice kind of, uh, and, and I am no farmer, I am no soil ecologist, I don't really know this. This is just what I'm deriving and I would love to improve this. So anybody who wants to send me better links to this. But what I'm understanding about uh, pattern languages is, uh, and actually, um, this is kind of a pattern language for healthy soil, uh, except at the larger scales, treat your farm as an ecosystem and Fukuoka's four principles take it uh, a little bit broader. But uh, here we go. Here's Masanobu Fukuoka is the guy who wrote, no, who did no-till revolution, uh, no chemical fertilizers, no cultivation, no pesticides, no weeding, uh, which is then connected to soil fertility, et cetera, et cetera. So, so here's kind of a, a nexus of interesting things. Now, this is resources, not an argument. Um, so this is not exactly an example of, of the reason for this call, but it's one of the better places in my brain where uh, I've really brought a whole bunch of things together. Uh, this my ahas about uh, soil and growing and raising food. Um, so one that was the, the pivot point for the last Inside Jerry's Brain conversation is uh, here, which is this libertarian beliefs uh, thought. And, um, and so I fleshed out from looking at lots of places and trying to figure out uh, what's going on, uh, some, some things like people have an absolute entitlement to the property that their labor produces is a libertarian principle or belief. Uh, libertarians object to unjustified takings uh, they basically seem to believe that wealth redistribution is invariably unnecessary and counterproductive. Uh, and they see the state as the principal enemy of liberty. So there's a, a whole bunch of kind of scripts around this, like markets work, governments don't. Uh, and the state should be, as Grover Norquist said, let's see if I've got the quote in my brain, uh, small enough that you can drown it in a bathtub. Uh, I don't, here we go. I don't want to abolish government. I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub, uh, is Grover Norquist's famous uh, quote. And Grover is a neocon uh, who was part of the contract with America and uh, is a big on tax reform, basically get, you know, driving our taxes to zero if at all possible. So these are all libertarian beliefs. And then I have a not well fleshed out uh, thought critiques of libertarianism, uh, where uh, the one part of it that I like is free markets are basically a myth. Uh, that you know, I, I seem to think that libertarians um, believe that if only we had a market for everything and the markets worked, uh, we would have a perfect society. And there's just really great and efficient uh, critiques of this notion of free markets and that markets work all the time. There's another notion that I haven't represented well here, which is that not everything works in a market, that, that commons in many ways uh, should not and cannot have markets. Uh, and I don't have that well captured. So that's a place, sort of an, an edge where I wanted to work. But I wanted to step back from this for a second. Jerry, Jerry the, yeah. other, the other concern there is that libertarians seem to presume that you can have markets without governments. 
Uh, and as far as I can tell, markets require rules set and held by somebody in order to function. So there seems to be a fundamental contradiction there. Yes, and, and I think that libertarians are looking for the minimum rule set for governing markets. So I, I don't know what libertarians think about the SEC, for example. Mm -hmm. um, should there be an SEC or should, you know, the New York Stock Exchange be self-regulating entirely and so with, with what set of rules, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and Gil, your mic is still open, so I'm hearing noise, but I don't know if you wanted to jump into that. Um, cool. So, Doug, any... Um, anything this triggers for you like like i'm i'm really <clears throat> i'm really interested in in your reflections on what i just showed because <clears throat> for me these parts of my brain are super useful and they collect up the best of what i've seen over a long period of time they may be unintelligible to like normal civilians <clears throat> or they may be on the fringe of okay useful but what about this or what about that so i'd, lo I'd love to walk into that territory well, I find that the, the brain, the way you showed it, is extremely useful, and I've been using it more and more myself. Uh, and it's a good summary of what happens, but it's not a good experience of how it happened. Uh, and that's a critical thing. And I, it's, for me, all the things online that I've seen for 30 years, uh, it's stale after a while and people drop out, and it's a problem. Uh, the idea of, recce of, of turning a map of conversation into one that's happening uh, is to be explored. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Gil, I just muted you because we're hearing a lot of ambient noise from you walking around, but uh, <clears throat> either raise your hand on the, on the thing or I think you've been unmuting yourself well as you go. Um, so, so uh, Doug, the thing you just raised raises like three or four other interesting questions for me, which is partly that my brain is just my mind map and it's an in inert space. It's not a conversational space. It's just a map of mostly links uh, to other resources, to essays, YouTube videos, uh, uh, ideas within essays, all that kind of thing. And I would like it to be more of a place. And you just said that, you know, things get stale after a while and people drop out. Uh, and then different conversations kind of have lifespans. You know, uh, there, are, there are places online, like in my, in my early days online, I was on the well. Uh, and I was on the GBN forum on the well, which was insanely cool. That was like my favorite place to go every day. Uh, and then there was also a, a, a forum called Experts on the Well, where kind of anybody would answer any question about anything. And these things were really cool. Loretta, thanks for joining. Um, uh, I, we're just sort of wandering into this topic of how to represent things in the brain and how to, how to uh, communicate through it. Um, and I'm interested in the medium that we use to communicate being also host to or able to hold the conversation that we're having. Um, and so that we might make it a generative space, but with the knowledge that these conversations have an ebb and flow. They, they basically, um, it, they have a natural life cycle, I think, that that something becomes hot for a while and then it dies. Now, if you sort of cruise the whole world, you can see the same conversation happening over and over again in lots of different communities at different points in time, right? Uh, if you're talking about soil fertility, I'm sure that conversation has been had a thousand times over in many different forums online, each with their own lifespan, each with their own little congregation of participants, the, you know, quirky and unique to that community and who it reached and how the word got out and how invitations were processed. So I think that's a kind of a, a, a side dish. But uh, I, I'm interested also in the conversational aspects of this medium. One of the things about the, con well, two things on my mind. One mm -hmm. is if a conversation is urgent, people will put up with terrible technology. Yes. Uh, if we think of the well, which I also was on for a long time, uh, you begin to see that the present counts more than the past more than it does in a face-to-face -face conversation. I don't know quite why that is, but in the online mediums, uh, the past tends to fade away very quickly. 
Um, so I have a couple of my own hunches about that. Um, one is that, that one of the reasons I was a lurker mostly and not that much of a participant on the well is that I had a feeling that I didn't really want to jump in without having read the threads and knowing what had been said already. And I have a really hard time reading long threads, a really, really hard time. They're not distilled. Uh, there's, there's like little nuggets of, wow, that's fantastic, which are then to me distracting because I then go follow this and follow that. And I find it really hard to catch up with online conversations of, of, of depth that, you know, if, if, the, if the conversation online was rich, that's going to be a stumbling block for me to just jump in and, and participate. So that's, that's one take on it. And then the second one is that one of the, my major insights from 22 years of using the brain is that because we don't have a history, a, a, a place that we're gardening and cultivating where we put what we knew, <coughs> things fade out of memory very, very quickly. So we then go back and have arguments and conversations over and over again. We basically debate the same things. And part of the reason we're easy to spin as a population by people who are busy lying every day is that nobody has said, okay, that lie, we already agreed last month that that's a lie. And the next time you say that lie, we're gonna turn off all the cameras and walk away. We don't do that because we don't have a, a shared memory, right? Um, and, and so, so one of the reasons I love the brain and I'm trying to figure out how to make it have more expressive capacity and more holding capacity for conversations, arguments, logic, evidence, et cetera, is that, is that this is the only tool I've found that lets me have a memory. It's not a good collaborative tool at this point. So I'd, I'd love to cross that bridge somehow, but I, I find that essential. So, so I, I think I agree with what you just said. And those are my two major kind of reasons why. Let me describe for a few minutes an experience that I had a number of years ago when I was at Metasystems Design. Uh, we were hired to do an online conference uh, for a pretty large group, and I struggled with these issues, and I came up with the following idea. This, when you would turn on the screen, you would see what looked like a cartoon drawing of a fairgrounds. So there were a bunch of tents on the screen and each tent had a flag which said what its content was, what was going on there. And then there was a little placard down by the front door of the tent, which said how many responses were there new for you since you were last there. So on the screen, you would basically see the whole conversation, all the conversations. Uh, there was an entrance tent where you could come in and talk to anybody about anything. Uh, there was an information tent about what was going on. Uh, and it would be easy to do a, uh, here are the key conversations going on tent. Mm -hmm. So it was actually quite successful. And it just left me with a view that graphical uh, navigation into the conversation is probably where we want to go next. And what's striking is how little exploration of that space there has been. Mm -hmm. Um, super interesting. And, and there have been a couple other graphical interfaces, but not of the kind you're describing. I mean, there was, a, there was an early Macintosh app, a conferencing app that was pretty cool that let you customize your avatar and everybody was seated around a round table. And you basically had good, good quality shared audio plus avatars that were sitting around. And that was about it. And, and otherwise, it, it wasn't recording. It wasn't creating space for different kinds of conversations. Um, and I wonder how how the tent fair um, fares, what, how you name the tents, you know, how you, how you square out the spaces matters a whole bunch. Um, when, when I'm approaching issues, often I'll take, a, I'll take a, an orthogonal perspective on the topic as, as much as I can because it cuts, it cuts away or cuts through traditional boundaries on issues which are which follow you know industry classification codes or which follow uh, normal assumptions about markets and marketplaces and and if you then if you if you instead pull on the thread of need or something like that you get a very different conversation so uh, so even like what the tents are named w could be very directive about what gets talked about where is that what happens well by creating some tents that were not content defined, uh, let people uh, mull around in a place where it was clearly marked mulling around. Mm 
Cool. Uh, for example, there was a coffee uh, uh, cafe tent where people could just go do stuff. And then you could, of course, you could pull out interesting nodes that were developing and make them into a new tent. I think of uh, the, the parent nodes in the brain in a certain mm -hmm. way could be tense. You don't yeah. want to have too many. Right. That's the problem uh, is that you, that's you have kind a... of, and moderation in that environment was very powerful. Uh, and it was important because the moderators did control uh, when a new tent would arrive or when mm -hmm. the tent could, might disappear. You could do interesting things like have uh, footprints between the tents showing a, uh, what might be a good way to follow a topic into its complexities. So you would see on the screen uh, a bunch of tents mm -hmm. and uh, uh, some footprints connecting two tents together. Interesting. And now, it, it was pretty successful. Yeah. Um, now at one point, like um, we were playing with virtual reality and other sorts of things for a while. And I remember uh, going to one of David Eisenberg's Freedom to Connect conferences. And uh, I, had a, I had a phone call that I had to run, so I had to dodge out of, out of the conference. But just, just as I was leaving, uh, the speaker came up who was gonna do like a, a virtual reality space um, and start sort of a, a, a distance conversation. And I predicted, and it was fulfilled before I even left the room, that this was going to be awkward and difficult. That you know, what he had to do was walk around in the space, go to a board that was virtually in the space, put an image on the board, try to address it. And, and all of that didn't work well in a, in, for completely different reasons than what you're saying. Um, and also because it was trying to make very, very representative in a 3D world, in a 3D virtual world, it was trying to emulate what might be happening in a normal world, where I think to you, the tents are metaphorical tents for conversations happening inside in text flows or, or whatever else, I don't know. But, but I think that there's a tendency to go to graphics and there's not a lot of collective intelligence on which ones work and which ones don't somehow. Um, so I've seen a bunch of fruitless graphical efforts to, to, to empower conversation and few that really get to the, 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 the nugget of how to improve conversations. Welcome back, Gil. Uh, and do you want to jump in? Except you just turned around and got mugged by somebody. No. Okay, well, let me talk again for a minute. Um, yeah, here I am. Oh. Uh, I, I, I just want to say, I think it's not a matter of fruitless graphics, but that, very, that it, takes, it takes real training. Uh, and very few people are adequately trained in doing it well. So you see, you know, like anything else, there's this, you know, 2% excellence and 80% not so great. And, you know, 10%, yeah, okay, all right, curve. Yep. And One of the know, things that, yeah. in my experience uh, was that it's very hard in an online conversation to question hidden assumptions or to shift the framework. Yeah, it's very easy to build on top of what's there, kind of like putting bricks on top of a pile of bricks. But it's very hard to get into the inner structure of the pile of bricks as it exists and say, let's rethink this. Jack, uh, have you ever have you ever seen that done well online? No. Not ever? Okay, that's too bad. Jerry, how about you, ever? I probably have, but I don't remember where or when because it would have been seldom and in very disparate kind of spaces. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I, I, I love Zoom. I do a bunch of Zooms now, but in Zoom, I lose a lot of the skills I have in a room with humans um, mm -hmm. because when I'm sitting across the table from people or in chairs with people, I'm watching a lot of personal behavior, body language, um, I, when somebody sighs, uh, other kinds of things. I'm, I'm sort of Fair, much pheromones. more- Pheromones. Yeah, pheromones. pheromones in the air, vibrations between our neural packages. Um, I, I, I'm much more tuned and I can interrupt in a different way than I do, or I can make side contact mm -hmm. in a different way than I can on Zoom. So I lose a lot yeah. of that capacity yeah. in a Zoom call, yeah. which yeah, I regret. Part, Go ahead. Part of it, I think, part of it's a question of scale. So I find that when we have big Zoom calls and break up into Zoom rooms, we have three or four or five people in a sub room, you know, 
a bunch of smaller conversations come back and collect into the group. That's better, but you know, also you can't do that every time and it takes some skill to facilitate. Right, and, and, I, and I say that part about the subtle sort of communications in face to face, partly also because that helps me sometimes intercept the conversation and you know, put a big fish on the table of the thing that's not being talked about. And that is sort of a method for shifting uh, the frame of reference or the topic or calling something out or whatever. And sometimes it requires that. And if you're not even in Zoom, but you're in a text flow, um, I've seen many conversations where somebody said something brilliant and it just basically floats off into the history of the chat, right? It's something like, like a really insightful piece gets, gets contributed to the conversation. It's sitting right there. My frustration is because it's now in a private thread in a chat someplace, it's not going to be recorded for, for posterity anywhere else. It has no permalink. So worse, uh, from my 22 years of having the brain, I love permalinks. I need a, I need, I need a link to the nugget so that I can you know, curate it into the, my own set of, of, of topics and issues. Um, so I see great things just float by and it's very hard to get other people to pay attention to those things. Jerry, what if there was a designated role called not only not facilitator or not only facilitator, but also observer and harvester? Um, so funny you should mention not this. not a, actually not a participant, but somebody who's there just to listen and to trap the nuggets. So uh, a year ago, I invented a role exactly like what you're describing uh, that I haven't had a chance to test out anywhere. Um, and I think I put up a baby website that doesn't have much on it, but I call this role the story threader. Yeah. And, and so would this be like an online version of a David Civet mapping? Um, yes, yes and more. So this, this role is born from my frustration with graphic recorders because I know a lot of really good ones. And I was just at an event a month ago with, where there were two very good graphic recorders. They were really skilled at distilling, but then at the end of the day, what they have is an, is a, an image that Thank they you. take a picture of and they send the picture to the attendees and, it, and this, the thing all dies, right? And when a speaker says income inequality in the United States, it, it's, it's pixels uh, you know, in, in an image, it's not connected to that thought, which then lets you dive deeper, have a conversation, do whatever. So. So one piece of that frustration leads me toward part of the conversation we're having here, which is what might the next medium look like that supports not just the presentation and sharing of ideas and insights, but also the conversations behind it. That's interesting. But the other, the other way that, that I took this was this notion of story threaders. And I was going to invite a series of people, maybe six people for a meeting of 100 people. So I was going to invite six people whose role would be to be in the meeting, either in person or virtually. Um, and their job is to listen for nuggets, uh, interesting things that jump out at them, and then to thread those nuggets together into their own narrative and to express that story in any medium they want. And the invite letter that I have for this role, uh, basically it has a paragraph in it that's, a, that's larded with examples, each of which is a link to, to something else. So Nikki Case is a really good example because he makes these explainer videos that are games, that are interactive, that are blah, blah, blah. But it, it could be an interview series. It could be a board game. It could be a card deck. It could be, I, don't, I sort of don't care what the medium is because what I was trying to do with story threaders was raise the requisite variety of ways of expressing interesting yeah. things said in the room. And so there's I was trying to get, and I, and I was trying to give these story threaders permission to not have to be note takers because the graphic facilitator's role is to capture as well as possible everything important that got said. So I wanted to free the story threaders of that responsibility. Sorry, back to you in the booth or in the hallway, Gil. Yeah, uh, uh, A, I love this a lot. B, I think there's a couple of different layers to the story threader as you're describing it. One is the listening and harvesting that they do, and second is the form that they are uh, collating and expressing that in, which some of which can be real time and sounds like some of it could be after the fact. Yes. Um, yes. I, 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 smell, I smell resonances, resonances of this in World Cafe and Warm Data Labs, uh, where you have the kind of, you know, rota people rotating among themes and leaving something captured on the table that threads the conversation together. And that may be an interesting place to start this experiment is on top of one of those. I'm going to run for a door, excuse me. <laughs> uh, and I'm going for warm data in my brain here Hi. for a moment. 
Yeah. So I, I, I would encourage you to launch this experiment when you next find it suitable. It's a great idea. Yeah, interesting. Now, um, World, World Cafe to me is a relatively limited process because it's, you know, people bouncing from table to table, drawing on the tabletop, and the person reporting back what the last group said and leading the conversation a little bit yeah. further. So I, I, find it, I find it an interesting but kind of um, low-grade form yeah. of, of conversation. I don't disagree, but your story threaders could, could, could be a layer on top of that. They could okay. be seeing what's written on the, tab on the tables yeah. harvest more effectively than the designated harvester does. Now I understand what you're and saying. And wander around and listen for meta themes and start to yep. build a story. I like that. Um, cool. So as an as a added instrumentation to uh, World Cafe, I totally get it. And then I haven't had a conversation with Nora about Warm Data Labs. I've watched, uh, I think I've watched this talk uh, on YouTube and I'm interested. So uh, she's trying to figure out how do we contextualize data, which makes a, a, t a total sense to me. Um, so here's her essay on warm data and uh, this whole idea of contextual relational interaction. Yeah. Any other thoughts on, uh, and also it, um, I think another inspiration for me was uh, Heinlein's notion of fair witnesses in the, I think it's in the moon is a harsh mistress or, or something like that. Um, this notion that there would be people that you could bring to a meeting and their job would be to report back exactly what was said. And this is before we had body, you know, video cams and all that. Um, <clears throat> but, but the fair witnesses have a, a very narrow specific purpose. So, so I was trying to broaden the mandate for story threaders and give them a lot of artistic freedom uh, to report the, in some sense, to rescue and shine a light on the outlier thoughts. Uh, Doug, I think that the, uh, my, my, my in my motivation for designing something I called story threaders was very much to find extremely useful minority reports that existed in the room that got lost. I was, I was trying to find a way to, to pull those out and make them beautiful and present them. And if we're really lucky, then one of these manifestations goes viral and, and you know, picks up a lot more interest. One of the problems with story threaders or graphic facilitators is they almost always have an implicit model where they think the conversation is going to be going. Mm -hmm. And they well, tend to feature that in every decision they make as to what to record. Well, Doug, isn't that a problem with humans? Yeah, but in the, in a, if we're in a room together, mm -hmm. the discomfort of a listener radiates to the whole group. And I think it's easier to keep the conversation flexible uh, in a face-to-face -face conversation in a way that gets lost on, on an online conversation. I know Jerry's looking at how do we overcome that difficulty? And I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, can you talk a little bit more about what I will call sort of the minority report in the room or uh, frame shifting, or I, I don't know what, what term you like, but, but this phenomenon we're, we're looking at. Well, it's how you look at a hidden assumption that a group carries. Uh, the conversations that I've been in lately, I wanna say, yes, but that's just part of Western civilization. We need to think more broadly. Wow, that's just hard to do. Right. Uh, with a group of people who are uh, grown up in Western civilization. They don't know how yeah. to get out of that box. Right. And uh, in a face-to-face -face group, you can do things like, you know, that, uh, and really get everybody's attention in a way that online doesn't work because the reality online is almost everybody's double tasking anyway. Um. Totally agree. Um, so for, I mean, a lot of my mind breaking things that let me see outside of Western civilization, for example, were kind of hard won. They were, they were, they were hard to get to. And, and one of my big questions is, how do you actually get somebody to open up, to soften up their brain enough to maybe consider the possibility of the prospect of maybe one day changing their mind about some firmly held belief? And so I spent a bunch of time yesterday in a, a, a loop because I, I, I ran across something where there's a, a, a Navajo who's running for president in this, in this 
presidential campaign. His, his name is Mark Trump. Uh, and you know, I, I went and I read this article about uh, Mar Mark Trump. Navajo enters the race as an independent. Okay, fine. And then I wound up going and listening to his TEDx talk. And his TEDx talk goes back to a Doom Diversas, which was a papal bull. And Gil, I'm going to have to mute you for a moment. Um, his, um, his TEDx talk goes back to the discovery doctrine. He basically says, look, um, you know, the, the popes basically gave people authority to own anything anywhere on earth where there were heathens, which meant not white people who didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Um, and this caused enormous uh, carnage all around the world uh, and disruption. And he goes back and, and talks about uh, Supreme Court cases that supported uh, the Doctrine of Discovery, et cetera, et cetera. And it really, it clicked into a whole nexus that I had about systematic abuse of Native Americans, systematic destruction of indigenous populations around the world, et cetera, et cetera. All of which is a conversation a whole bunch of people don't want to have. Just don't want to have. Like, hey, people have been hurt through history. You know, it's too bad these things happened. It happened so long ago. Can't we just get over it? There's a hundred different arguments for why not to talk about this. And yet, when you listen or try to listen clearly to something like uh, Mark Charles's TEDx talk, you're like, damn, he's completely right. And we haven't gotten over this. Um, uh, you know, the U.S. hasn't apologized for it. Uh, Canada has, um, you know, which is a start. I remember April and I were in Vancouver a couple of years ago and we went to a, the Arch Anthropological Museum that's at the university at the west end of Vancouver and they had a room about the residential uh, school system. And uh, there were in that room things you might expect, artifacts and stories told about, uh, about the whole system. And this is where basically we kidnapped children from tribes and put them in schools to westernize them. And this happened across the US, it happened across Australia, it happened across Canada. Uh, and these, these children are called the lost generations. And what, what really whacked me over the head in that particular exhibit in that museum in Vancouver was, there were four apology letters printed large, larger than me, uh, in a corner of the room, one next to the other. One was from the Catholic Archdiocese, one was from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, one was from the Government of Canada, and I forget what the last one was. And these were genuine apologies. Like if you read through them, we fucked up. This is what we did. You are valuable. We are sorry. This is what we're doing to make amends, et cetera, et cetera. These were really great apologies. The U.S. can't even touch, you know, going into that territory. So, so sorry for the long digression. But for me, the things that open up a conversation and make space for changing your mind about how you see a situation that change the frame around it, that let you talk about a different form of economics or measuring a different set of valuable things than the GDP and whether the Dow went up today, which is what economists tend, tend to think about as, you know, as, as value, um, requires breaking things that people hold dear. And in order to get to a place where they can consider the prospect of the possibility of, of doing that, I don't know what they need, but one of the things they might need is a little bit, a little sense of personal safety, some sense that if I consider this thought, my world won't fall apart, and maybe a couple other things, and I don't know what they are, but I'm, I'm extremely interested in my life and creating that moment for people. Jerry, let me jump in for a second because I've been going out for another for another meeting. I, I I really appreciate where you're going here, and it strikes me that you're that you're edging into conversations about relationship and power. Yes. Um, and the 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 progressive meme does not like to talk about power, but we need to, uh, and that's part of what's at play here. I mean, if you look back to when was it that the popes gave that dispensation for discovery, it's going to tie in with the you know, with the the expansion of uh, exploration and, um, and, col and colonization, probably, and giving permission for power, and of course, who are the popes working for, and so forth. Uh, so I think that's one thing that has to, has to come into these conversations in a really explicit way. Um, relationship is, is key, because a lot of what we're talking about here is conversations with out deep relationship or with strange multi-layered semi-ephemeral relationships. Yes. Uh, Vicky, Ro Vicky Robin had a beautiful post either this morning or yesterday about, about living in groups. 
and she's, you know, she's traveling with a group of people, very different experience than traveling by herself. And she's provoked some interesting stuff there, which takes us back, of course, to Dunbar number. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do we live with each other and how do we deal with frustration and breakdown and power and so forth when we are stuck with the same group of, you know, 10 or 50 or 100 people forever, mm -hmm. as opposed to the world that we're in now. And it may be that the world of climate collapse gives us something more like that than what we're playing in now. What if we didn't have all this online stuff to do? What if we lived in a village forever with the same group of people? How would we act? What would we do? How do we interact? What can we learn from that to bring into this larger conversation mm -hmm. that hopefully we still have for a long time? And with that, I'm very curious to hear the rest, but I've got to dive for another commitment. So thank I you. Um, thank you for being here, Gil, even in motion. And I will post this on YouTube so you can uh, pick up at m minute 40 or whatever and super and good. To the rest and, if you'd like. And I'm going to try to keep closer track of your, of your perambulations and opportunities than I have it. So thanks. Thank you. And uh, Loretta, you've been muted this time. Hi, Doug. Um, you're muted by default when you come into this conversation. Love, love to hear from you if you'd like to jump in. Um, but we will, uh, we will continue here. Uh, Doug, where does it, all of this put your 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 mind? Well, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've been thinking as we're talking about the conditions of listening to each other. Uh, typically, in a group, everybody's rehearsing what they're going to say next rather than listening. Agreed entirely. So the thing is how to slow that process down. Uh, I ran for a long time a uh, seminar, I don't know what to call it, in Palo Alto called Serious Conversations. And it was a face-to-face -face group of about 15 people we met every Wednesday night for six or seven years. Wow. Pretty amazing. And there was some training of people up front in ways that were pretty easy. Uh, the meeting would start by going around the room, uh, one person starting and then going to their left from there, saying what's on, been on their mind that they think is most worthy of a serious conversation. By the time you'd gone around the room, the atmosphere was extremely rich and thick. Then the question of the psychology of listening. What I wanted to explain to the group and tried numbers of ways of doing it is that when you listen to somebody things are being stirred up for you that you've never thought before mm -hmm. that have a different edge but your tendency is going to be to default to your expert knowledge and to say what you already know and you're also and I want you to make a choice to not be the expert but to be a person mm -hmm. and it was pretty successful uh, and people got it. Uh, in the beginning, it took a number of sessions, but as we went along and added new people, they would get it in five minutes and could play by those rules. Mm -hmm. And it was quite powerful, but I felt we never went quite far enough mm -hmm. in being able to get people to talk from what's emerging in their mind that had not been there before. But that was critical. Uh, and I had in the back of my mind, I think it's a Maori tradition, that when you have a group discussion, which tend to be among the Maori quite vigorous, mm -hmm. when a speaker stops, everybody sings a song before the next person talks. Wow. That's pretty interesting. Uh, I wanted to experiment with uh, just five seconds of silence. Mm -hmm. uh, if you say, look, I mean, here, here are some rules. Uh, let people finish when they're talking. Don't interrupt. But the corresponding principle is, since you know you're going to be heard, keep what you say short. And for God's sakes, don't use listening to yourself as, a, as a, an encouragement to keep on talking. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, to, but to seriously stop. So I think the, the subtext here is that the group needs some thinking about how to think together. Uh, the natural thing of preparing yourself like a slingshot to fire your marble into the group as soon as you can get the floor is not the proper model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of what you just said, I'm going to just be quiet for a little moment.
and, and I'm a little informed by Quaker meeting, which believes a lot in silence. Um, and I attended a Wilton monthly meeting in Connecticut for a couple of years before I moved into Manhattan. And we had, um, we had a, a kind of a troublemaker in the meeting. His name was John Lee. He was a retired engineer. And he wasn't really a troublemaker. It's just that every meeting he would have a message. And usually that doesn't happen. Um, but he would always stand during meeting and say something. And, and it wasn't always sort of profound or whatever. I mean, there's kind of a, a process where you know what a message is in a meeting. Um, and it's called speaking from the light. There's a, a, this, and, and participating in Quaker meeting is a version of what you just said. Is a, there, there's, a, there's a way you learn the dance of, of how to be in meeting and how to prepare yourself when you sit down in meeting and what to listen for and when you have a message and how to share it. So all of that. It, he was basically violating it. So at one point we had a, a, a meeting after meeting, which was with the intention of, you know, improving our vocal ministry, I think it's called. Um, and a couple people spoke up, couple, nobody really pointed to the elephant in the room. And then John spoke and he said, I know I speak too much. And everybody just doubles over laughing, just doubles over laughing. He's, I know I speak too much. And then he goes in and says, I, blah, blah. I don't remember what he said after that. I just remember that, that all of us were suddenly smiling, going, well, okay. Uh, and, and Quakers are a little probably too indirect about things. They don't, you know, no, nobody was going to lance that boil directly uh, in that meeting. But, but we, there needed to be a space within which the conversation could be had about the conversation. And there was a process to do that, et cetera. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm driven back here to uh, who the heck was it who said, you know, I, I love socialism, but I, I value my evenings, um, right? All of this stuff about how do we have better conversations takes time and patience that we've been taking away from everybody because you've got to go back and finish that, you know, binge watching that Netflix series. And I don't know what other important things we all have on our agendas. And we're so drowning in the info flood that making room for listening well uh, is hard. So, so. I'm appreciating right now, given that I started this call about how to present ideas and how to, and you know, how to flash through the brain and then, and then, and wait a minute, how does all that fit into a context where good listening happens, deep listening happens, and how to express ideas in a way that can be heard, which is like a, a different topic, but a related topic, right? Because if, if there's a thought in my brain that said, you know, all conservatives are idiots, which I do not believe, but if I had that as an argument, that would bounce people immediately out of that place and they wouldn't be able to engage because like, well, this guy's an idiot who clearly wrote that. Um, so all of that. So um, probably the most successful coaching I did in that seminar was the following. I said, the reason to talk is not to convince others, but to stimulate them. And as soon as you see that you've done that, guess what? It's time to shut up or you will destroy the very thing you just created. Don't oversell. Don't oversell. And uh, you and I are probably somewhat uh, guilty of that. Yep. Sorry, I'm just trying to capture in the chat what you just said. Um, yeah, and we're, we're excited about the things we've seen. We're trying to express them. We're, and it's easy to get sort of caught in, in your own wave of enthusiasm uh, about whatever. And, and, and to me, I, I love uh, telling connective stories. So I'm, I'm very inspired by uh, James Burke's uh, Connection series, right? And I, I watched that as a kid on TV and when it first showed up in PBS. And I was like, oh, wait. So like innovation happens when somebody notices from over here and over here, and if we glue this together, we get this other thing, and then that somebody else builds on that, and then the sort of the accidents and confluences and insights and all of that kind of moves through. And, and then bad shit happens throughout history as well, which James Burke didn't really talk about very much, but, but there's a whole bunch of, of terrible stuff that happens along the way, some of which causes backlash and innovation and so forth, <clears throat> um, all of which makes for really fun stories to tell, right? So let me bring you back to uh, what your hope was for this conversation. Uh, and where is the center of gravity of that? 
So I think we've talked about my hope for the conversation and broadened it and deepened it in, in really good ways. So partly my initial hope was, <clears throat> all right, I've been feeding this thing for 22 years. How do I make it more accessible, more useful, more powerful as a tool for what's up? Then how do we expand it and move into some other place where it can become the holder of conversational spaces around all these topics? And, and one of the frustrating things for me is, let's say we were in a good discussion thread on the well um, way back in the day, there was no place to bring in context in the well. It was just words that were scrolling off the screen. And if you were smart, you were saving the buffer and storing those as files on your floppy disk. Um, you know, back in the day when we did that. Um, I, I, side story, but one day a guy named Blair Newman committed suicide on the well. And uh, I date, so I joined the well, I think two months after Blair's suicide. And um, he, a week before he physically killed himself, he had scribbled himself on PicoSpan, which was the software on the well. And that meant that he had destroyed all of his own posts. And the community reconstructed all his posts because most everybody had been saving their logs. So they created a thread where they put all the posts and, and assembled them again. And then I learned at some point that my mom had a bridge buddy who was Blair Newman's mom. And I have no idea how I discovered that, but I printed out that thread, gave it to mom, who gave it to her. And I realized, oh my God, the stuff that's happening online is very, very real and is really important. That was my, that was my first light bulb going off that this stuff really mattered and was different, uh, et cetera. And I have no idea whether she read the thread or that it got to her, I don't know. But I just know that that, that connection happened in my head. Um, so, so I have three or four different projects that are simmering but not boiling over yet that might turn into what could ne the next brain-like conversational stratum, techno stratum look like? Um, and could we build one and prototype it? And this conversation is informing that a lot. So uh, the, the brain itself is such an amazing medium. And I would think if it can have two innovations, one is that when there are multiple players, what they say shows up in a color that's specific to that person. Right. Uh, and another would be that somehow it could be marked as to how new it is in the conversation. If we had those two things, the brain might be pretty darn good at a conversation which is spread out over time. So for how new it is, uh, one way you could do that is that older text could be more opaque, could fade basically uh, over time. That, that would be a pretty easy way to, to, to visually mark uh, older things. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, because then the past dies. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want that. Okay, I me want too. I want to stay present. And, and what I discover is, and this is interesting because I have a thought in my brain which I can show, but you know, we've outsourced our memories to Google and that was a mistake, right? Because the tools for collecting up what we like as it floats by are so terrible that most of us give up on that mission. Uh, and we're like, well, I don't have to do that because I can just search for it later and Google it and Google will remember it which is actually not really true because I have stuff stored that is old in my brain that no longer gets any Google juice or is even no longer on the web, except it was in, it's in the internet archive someplace. And these are really, really great nuggets. Like they're fantastic. But unless you were curating along the way 20 years ago, you wouldn't have known to store them any place or to put them into that spot where they're useful again, 20 years later. And so, and so, Partly the, the drowning in the info flood of real-time flows of everything um, is killing us because it, it prizes the freshest thing anybody said, the latest thing anybody said, and it deprecates uh, and depreciates older wisdom. And, and part of what I really appreciate is that I can go back and find you know, essays from long ago uh, or, or books published long ago that are, that are still completely timely or whatever. Um, but to me, they're as fresh as, as today's stuff because 
when I look around in a particular place in my brain, I see how important what was said there was, right? So, so I have, and I've got a little video that where I say I have a hunch I'm having a, a really unique experience here with the brain that I'm, because of this curation exercise for a couple decades, I'm having a different experience of information and what I remember than anybody else is having. So as you're talking, it suggests to me that something that I'm actually doing now, I hadn't paid attention to so much. And that is uh, iBooks does a nice graphical interface of the books that you're reading with the covers. And if you look across a hundred books that are in there, it's an incredible slice through what you've read. And it's a good, it's so easy to click on one of the covers and see where you've made underlines or uh, stopped reading. Uh, it, I'm using it a lot as that kind of memory. And until we're talking now, I hadn't been aware of that. Interesting, I'm yeah. doing it, but not aware of it. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and I use Kindle Reader. I don't, I don't have a Kindle device. I don't want to have a separate device to read on. So I use the Kindle Reader and mostly read on an iPad, sometimes read on my iPhone, never read on the Mac that I'm talking to you now through. Never use Kindle here, but I highlight a lot in Kindle. And then I use other apps. I use uh, Readwise, I think it's called, which every day Readwise sends me a random collection of snippets that I highlighted from somewhere in Kindle. So... So every day I get a little bit of a reminder from Against the Grain by James Scott and uh, The American Slave Coast by Ned and Connie Sublette. But that's an incredible book. Yes. Against the Grain. It's Against just the Grain really thrilled fun. me. Thrilled me. <clears throat> and is one of those that changed my head, right? And, and so this is weird. And I'm going to switch tracks for a second because this goes back to the heart of something we were saying that was really fun. For some reason I can't fully explain, I love, love and look for those moments where something I thought I knew was kind of off and I need to change what I, what, I, what I thought. And when those moments happen, my head cracks open in a, in a way I really like. And most people are, I think, change resistant. Like when something challenges a firmly held belief, they're not like that. And I'm probably fooling myself about some firmly held beliefs because I believe people are inherently good, uh, you know, and it's perfectly reasonable to think that people are inherently bad, that, that most people are evil. That's like a, a commonly held belief. And, and that to me is sort of a part of our, our battle of ideas in the world. But, but I, I had one with when I was watching uh, um, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Charles's uh, talk. And he was framing stuff that I'd kind of heard of, but hadn't assembled quite in the way he did. And it was a bit of a brain opener. And, and so, again, I'm trying to figure out how do we make people enjoy that moment or look for that moment, rather than curl up in defensive postures and, and make sure they retain membership in their posse or tribe, because another thought in my brain is that membership uh, trumps, membership and emotion trump logic all, you know, all the time. I, it's interesting because I also watched the Mark Charles video yesterday uh, for the first time. How was, did you get to it? No idea. Okay, <laughs> so, up, so we, we I, both I, yes, did I know. It showed up in my Twitter feed. Um, Might have been me. No. It wasn't. Okay, cool. No, but uh, anyway, and I loved listening to it. And yes. thought, so authentic and he's saying this so well but towards the end i realized this cannot be a presidential candidate because he has no focus on any issue outside of that set of issues um possibly he doesn't talk about it but i, I was wondering okay so what forward-looking agenda would he propose i don't know there wasn't it wasn't present in his talk totally right i mean he's not talking about climate change He's, he's saying not. we should have truth and conciliation commissions to get the hell over these issues. Right. And then it's like green fields. Don't know. Right. I agree, I agree with that. Anyway, yeah. so let's say, where was I going to go? Oh, yeah. On these moments where your brain is lit up by a thought you'd never had that puts into question other things that you've thought. 
the person who is the most radical at doing that, in my experience, was Malcolm X hmm. in his autobiography. And from the time he was a, uh, a teenager, if he came across something which questioned what he believed, he would shift. And he did it over and over again. It was really quite remarkable. And the book is a great teaching from that point of view. So read his autobiography? Yeah, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Fabulous, thank you. Um, and I've never read it. Um, and I read some James Baldwin and a few other people that were like, holy crap, you know. Um, and it's, it's funny, so, so uh, just last week, um, I ran across some post somewhere of a guy who said, here's my reading list for, you know, this is what I read this year. And I want to lean in and, and like fine tune this better. And I looked at his list and it was all white men. Like, to, like there were 25 books and I, I don't read 25 books in a year, I don't think, but, but they were all white men. And some of them were great books. They were really interesting. And so I wrote a slightly snarky comment on his blog post. And it was just a, a regular blog, I think. Um, and I said, hey, uh, you know, consider reading non-white guys for a year. That might change your point of view. And then that turned into a post I did on Facebook just saying, hey, hey, Facebook brain, um, what, what would be on your reading list? And that turned into, I'll share the thought here um, as we're talking, that turned into this place in my brain, which is the my uh, non-white guy canon. Um, there we go. Uh, so that turned into this thought in my brain and I got a lot of really good recommendations from people and I bought the book Kentucky's, uh, which is in Spanish. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I will add Malcolm X's um, autobiography to this list is kind of what I'm saying, but I'm trying to figure out, I, I think that just telling stories just telling stories about what happens in these works is an interesting path for somebody to get acquainted and find their way into different ways of seeing. Yeah, very, very rich. I'm very struck these days by how much of the good things that are being written in social theory and economics are being done by women. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and certainly, if you look at good commentaries, the number of names of Indians is shocking, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, By the way, have you read yeah. any of Ghosh, G-H-O-S-H? I don't think so. I have to f try and remember. Am Amitav? Yeah. Yeah, Amitav Ghosh, Incendiary Circumstances, The Great Derangement, The Hungry The Great Tide. Derangement is an incredible book. Climate Change and the Unthinkable. Gun what Island. he does is put together really good uh, technical knowledge huh. with uh, being a novelist who is very sensitive to the role of literature. Wow. Awesome. I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, thank you. And Malcolm X, I think, I think um, so you're talking about the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley, this one? Yeah, I think that's, well, um, I don't remember the extension. I think there's only one autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, check it on Amazon and see. I will go look and see what else is there. Cause I think the reason I might not have picked this one up is the Alex Haley, <laughs> Alex Haley angle. I don't know, right. which might've discouraged me from picking it up, but I, I will go figure out, or let, let's both figure out which one because uh, I will add that to the canon and I uh, should read it. Um, huh. So one of the things I'm feeling at the moment is you're putting stuff in the brain. Actually, it's a pretty good map of our conversation. Uh, and it's encouraging because I know I can go back to it. Right? right. And it's not forced into a linear mode, which would make yeah. it dead, even if it's good. And I, you know, friends who do note taking in Google Docs or on Modi's CD or whatever it's called, uh, you know, we're all trying to sort of annotate what we know and share links. And, and, and I, I copy the chat out of the Zoom calls and paste them on the email when I send out, hey, here, the call is up online. And it's, it's all pretty inert. I find it all, um, it's interesting to scroll through and it might make a shortcut to see what happened. 
and you can harvest some interesting links from it, but it's not the same. And, and for me, the context, which improves over time, uh, is vital. And, and so, so I have, again, I have this, this unique lesson for the value of that kind of context within a limited tool. And parts of the limits of the tool I love. So I think the one thing, let me just share my, my brain again. Um, I think the one thing I can point to that I love about the brain is that you can only connect thoughts to each other through these three little circles called gates, which means you have to choose if something is above, below, or next to something else. So, there's the, so the brain forces you to say there's only relationships up, down, or sideways. It's only two kinds of relationships possible in the brain. And that was incredibly clarifying to me and, and, and gives me an enormous expressive power <clears throat> that other tools don't have somehow. You can also see the brain in a rubber band diagram. You can, uh, you know, you can do uh, different kinds of uh, displays. Let me see if I, I don't ever do this. Let me interrupt for a moment yeah. before you leave that, that uh, Malcolm X. Thing. If we look at this screen, just like this, I would like to be able to go in with my uh, cursor and pick a place in the blue and start a new thought where I don't yet know how it integrates with what's yeah. there. Yes. And so in my own mental meanderings about what would be beyond this, I would love for there to be a space where uh, basically where all of our thoughts are commingled so that your brain and my brain can coexist and where we figure out what the visual representation is so that you can compare your network of thoughts to mine and then connect them across that space so that as you're browsing your brain, you can then add by reference my stuff, which shows up visually a little bit different. So you know that I put it in and I'm maintaining it. So, so it might change spontaneously as I, as I update some entry. Um, and very important to me, at some point, I always want there to be like the big red button where, okay, I'm overwhelmed by, by mingling through everybody's brains and adding in too many things. Take me back only to the things that I added so that I'm back then in what I consider sort of normal ter known territory, because even though I have more than 400,000 things in this brain, I kind of know what I put in here. I know that it's safe. I know that it's pretty, pretty trustworthy. And as I would bridge into other people's and start including by reference and start mapping nearby, um, that would get a little scary over time. So I'd need to be able to back up to what, where I know is safe. And then uh, a couple last thoughts it would be interesting to have a GitHub kind of model here as well, um, where you could fork and pull. And are you familiar with how GitHub works? No. So GitHub replaced uh, SourceForge as the place where open source projects went because it had a different model for how to update uh, uh, code. And in SourceForge, basically uh, the, the dictator, the, the owner of any uh, piece of software um, had full control over it. Uh, in GitHub, uh, there's a process called fork and pull, which means anybody can go in and fork, mean, meaning copy somebody's entire repository known as a repo. Uh, so fork, pull, and merge. <clears throat> so, um, so you've put some, up, some body of code up in a, in a repo. I then fork it. First thing I do is I fork it, which takes an entire copy and drops it in my GitHub. I then work on it, uh, improve some part of it, and then submit a pull request to you because I think this is good enough that it should be in the main body of code, which you appear to be the host of, Un you know, until and unless my fork becomes the more popular fork. But I submit a pull request to you and you can I, you know, say yes or no. If you say yes, my request then goes into the major body of code and, and that gets replicated out to everybody. Um, that's really interesting, right? So, so then you sort of merge the code into the main body of code. Um, what if I could do this with a brain-like interface? Now, people are using GitHub um, to do to write books. There's a thing called Gitbook, um, which uh, which takes this fork and pull process. Um, here are repos, pull requests. So if I go to Gitbook, <coughs> um, I have it under GitHub for writing projects and GitHub enhancements, which I didn't make pop enough so I couldn't see it when I went when I was on Git, uh, Gitbook, it's on GitHub itself. But people are writing books this way. So they'll publish their chapters on, on GitHub and then people can submit um, edit uh, recommendations or write whole chapters and submit them through Gitbook. Does that make sense? 
So yeah. now I'm so now I'm thinking, what would a brain look like that had that kind of process behind it? Um, and and I'm torn about whether it's fork it's fork and pull where you might start with a full repo of my brain, and then just fork it and and you know submit uh, comments and additions to me or whatever. I'm not I'm not not entirely sure how that works over the longer term with more people participating. Because partly I, I'm I'm interested in other people's brains and from scratch de novo. Yeah, and your, yours is so rich and complicated, and mine is so kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I tell people is don't be overwhelmed by mine because it's useful when you have a hundred things in it. Um, and so you'll be happy. And, and part of the fun is inventing your own clues for how to deal with repetitive things. Right. The so, thing that's got me going most with the brain is uh, doing uh, a, a parent link called uh, readings. And underneath that are the months. And under there are all the things I'm reading within that month. And I can just go there and click on it and it's open, right? Which is, it just turns out to be much faster than any other way mm -hmm. of getting those things. Cool. Do you take then, notes course, in your brain? As you read something, do you take notes in the brain? Uh, I've experimented with using that side panel for notes. Right. Uh, with most, well, like with Kindle, you can get a printout of the notes for each book, right? Right. And I've experimented a little bit with putting them in the side panel in the brain. But for the most part, no, I've put them into, uh, I've been a long time user of uh, Apple's uh, OneNote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've used that. Okay. Uh, and I do the same thing with Evernote. So I'm, I'm a long time user of Evernote and I use Evernote for everyday notes and note taking during meetings and all that. And I'll say that the next version of the brain, the brain 11, the major change is that Harlan and his and his team rewrote the notes editor uh, because a third of their tech support calls were for this embedded editor that somebody else wrote. Uh, and so they rewrote a, a markdown editor from scratch that is completely multi-platform, which is, I've seen it's pretty elegant. And they're also considering making the notes part of the brain a much up, more upfront part of the brain experience, which both troubles me and interests me because I deprecate the notes. I don't take notes in the brain. I minimize that part of the screen as much as I can. I, I, I don't really use it. And yet, if I could merge everything I do in Evernote into the brain, it would be much, much more findable, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It might be really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, you probably have the experience that I do that we make a lot of notes that we never go back to. Mm. So they're lost. Right. Uh, which is not, I'm trying to overcome that. Right. I have a friend uh, who uh, every day he reads his notes from yesterday. Smart. But he also reads his notes from 10 days before. And he picked 10 days because if you do a week, things tend to have the same structure to them. Right. Oh, interesting. 10 days breaks that up. Very good uh, strategy. It's actually kind of fun. Another, another reason to do that is spaced repetition. Um, and if you've ever used, um, what is the language, Duolingo. Yeah. Um, Duolingo uses um, the theory of spaced repetition as a way of training you to learn a language. And it, it basically says that your memory fades at a predictable, predictable rate. And if we quiz you uh, on a particular time schedule, you'll remember things better. So that would, that, that would be a different reason to go back and and <clears throat> look at your notes. Right. And I find that like, I, I, it'd be interesting to look at your notes from a year ago or a decade ago, because um, we really do forget everything we've seen. We forget everything we've gone by. It's, a, it's astonishing. Well, I do that some, and the shocking thing is, my God, I thought that already 15 years ago. Right. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. This is not a new thought. Like, and we get better at expressing these things. They get more complicated, they get richer. They, we connect them to more things. We understand them in more depth. We've talked to them, you know, about them with other people. But you look back and it's like, wow, we were already saying this thing 10, 15 years ago, no problem. It happens a bunch. So is there coming up any possible experiment with a couple of people working in the same brain? 
So there is a version of the brain called Team Brain, which I've never used, which Mark Trexler, the Climate Web brain user and brain publisher, does use. He says they use Team Brain all the time. <clears throat> I've not gone into that with him. And at one point, we were going to start an experiment collaborating on a bit of a brain, but that never really took off. So it's doable. I, I just suspect that it's not the architecture that I'm looking for or thinking about. So, um, and, in, and in particular, you know, I need the ability to back up and see only what, I, what, what I've curated. <clears throat> um, so I'm not sure. You might take a look at my website where I have a link at the, on the top, uh, readings, mm -hmm. things that I'm reading. And there are the books by month uh, copied over from the brain. And I'll give you a sense of, of where I am. I, th I think you, you and I probably should have a, a more continuous and interesting conversation. That sounds awesome. I would love that. Uh, the thing that's most on my mind these days is the problem. It goes like this. Most economists and public intellectuals think that if we could only get the cost of uh, alternative generated electricity, solar panels and wind, to be on a parity with the cost of energy generated by fossil fuels. Then we'd be in a new ball game and everything would be hunky-dory. What they leave out is the fact that if you own a house and you heat it with gas, shifting to electricity is a multi-thousand dollar project which is a great resistance to being able to change to using cheaper mm -hmm. uh, fuel. And people seem to not know that. They go talking as though, if you just get the cost down to parity, it's, right. it's okay. So that, then, uh, that's, uh, that doesn't apply to all electric appliances if you can get clean electric energy, but it applies to every gas appliance, for example. <laughs> yeah, and we have in the US, 55% uh, of all houses are heated by gas. Hmm. That's 80 million houses. Now think with each one shifting out of gas and into electric, that's a huge conversion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only that, how are you gonna build 80 million new electric furnaces? Mm -hmm. The environmental drawdown of doing that is huge. Mm -hmm. And I'm just struck by the fact that people don't move into this territory. They stay in the idea that if we can just get parity, we're done. Mm -hmm. So. Interesting. Um, and w which of your sites do you mean? Do you mean Shakespeare and Dow or? No, DougCarmichael.com. Oh, okay. The others are pretty, are all dead. Okay. <laughs> And does that come up with the right thing? I'm going there now. Uh, so carmichaelconversation.com? Yeah. Okay, yes. Cool. And there's readings. Yep. Yeah, because yeah, you and my brain doesn't show dougcarmichael.com, but I have a whole bunch. Let me just show you you and my brain. Uh, up. So here's you and my brain. Um, so I've got Big Mind Media and uh, INET and a bunch of other things, but I don't have DougCarmichael.com or um, Garden World. Uh, basically, Carmichael Conversation. Let's switch. So I bet that I bet that one of the things that I have here is in fact this site. <clears throat> yes, navigate to existing attachment. So what what name do I have on it? I have uh, Doug Carmichael and Garden World Politics. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Cool. And that should take you there. And I try and keep that pretty up to date. But of course, it would be fabulous if there was a way for the brain to be able to dump those new books uh, directly into the website. Yeah, exactly. Um, you could, I mean, the brain is sort of barely embeddable. It's, it's doable, but not great. But you can embed that link in your website. Right, and that's gotten actually a lot better. It's amazingly uh, fast, the web mm -hmm. version. Mm -hmm. They and sped then, things uh, up a bunch. <clears throat> cool, so um, we should wrap pretty soon. Where does this leave us on the original intent of the call? 
Well, I think we haven't talked very much about what a graphical interface could be besides the brain and my example of the tent. Mm -hmm. And I, I just would love to see more experiments. I mean, if you just have uh, um, come into a, a, a conversation with a screen that had topics and you just click on one and it goes there. And the topics are not organized in a hierarchical way. They're just right. spread around. Right. Uh, that would be pretty interesting. Yep. I don't see anybody mm -hmm. who's done that yet. Okay. There used to be a piece of software for the Mac that would let you create a website where you could just drag your mouse and create a little circle and link it to a file. Hmm. Uh, it was just automatic. It was, it, and they got rid of it. I think it was, I've forgotten what it was called. Interesting. Something like cupcake. It's not ringing a bell, but I'll think about it. Was it was not well, <clears throat> and they just dropped it. But I think cupcake was the name of it. Mm -hmm. I used it to do the tent, so I could uh, take a photograph of the tent drawing, put it on the screen, and uh, just use the mouse, select an area, and then type in a URL. And it would go right to that part of the conversation. So that was nifty. Very interesting. I don't think this is it, but funny enough, <clears throat> funny enough, given our conversation, I'll just share my screen real quick. Um, there is a, there was a project called Cupcake by Daniel Siders that was part of a protocol called Tent, <clears throat> which was a, an attempt to create open distributed social networking. And I'm quite sure this is not what you're talking about. No, but, but, it's but he, in the he, ballpark. But he wrote the Tent Manifesto, which I've put <laughs> under mani Manifesti. <clears throat> and of which there are very many. This is just A through C. Yeah. Um, and one of the things <clears throat> in my in my desired future brain-like thing, which I call open global mind, um, one of the things would be that that each layer would have kind of an API uh, or a protocol such that people could make a completely different interface to this thing and still be updating and talking and touching, uh, talking to and touching the same underlying data. It would need a distributed data model, basically. Cool. So that the tent interface would work perfectly fine. I could be busy accessing info and conversations through a brain-like interface. Somebody else could be using uh, Tent City. Somebody else could be using straight text. And we would all be able to have that conversation. I worry about, I mean, the, what we've learned from the internet, contrary to our original expectations, was uh, nastiness and destructive behavior. Right. And if we have too many different interfaces with too many people, it's easy to destroy it. Uh, entirely true. And if too many trolls are in the community, they can easily and handily destroy conversation as well. Yeah. So, so I think there's a whole bunch of social management that has to happen in some ways. Well, as usual, I'm delighted you're doing these conversations. Thank you very much. I'm delighted you were here. And it, 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 like, that was great. That was totally helpful to a bunch of things that I'm, I'm working on. So thank you, Doug. Excellent. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Oh.